Disney channels and still nothing interesting. I want my own TV. Fed up with TV, you have to hide from the kids. I want my own TV. The TV Food Network. Cooking, dining, news, talk, and health. I want my own TV. I want my own TV. The TV Food Network is mmm TV. Does that promo sound really dated? It is. It's from the very early days of the Food Network, which was then known as the Television Food Network, or TVFN. I'm Elizabeth Pearson Gar, and this is a slightly different version of the Experience Podcast. I won't be interviewing anyone. I'll be telling you all about one of my life experiences as one of the first employees of the TV Food Network. Here's an actual entry from my journal. Dated Friday, September 24th, 1993. The other night, as I was watching President Clinton give his health care reform speech, I had this non sequitur of a revelation. I must go to New York and get a job in television. Figuring that the most likely fit is the TV Food Network, I became so excited and transfixed by this conviction that I could hardly sleep and couldn't wait till working hours so I could call them and tell them what an outstanding employee I'd be. Okay, let me back up and give a little bit of context. As I was growing up and going through college, thinking about what I'd want to do as a career, one constant was always writing. I always loved writing. But also, in the back of my mind, I had this desire to work in television. In fact, as a young teen, I even fantasized about becoming the first female football announcer. Anyway, right after college, I decided I wanted to be a food writer. I went to cooking school to get some actual knowledge about cooking and food, in addition to just my interest in it, and I was a food writer for a little bit. While I wrote that journal entry I just read, I was sitting in my apartment in Washington, D.C., where I'd lived for less than a year but already knew it was time to leave. Work and a guy both played a part, but that's a story for another time. I'd recently read in a newspaper article that a new cable network was starting, focusing on food, and I thought, that's it, food and television. I found the name of one of the executives founding the network, Joe Langan, and an address, and I sent a letter and a resume. I remember writing in the cover letter, I'm going to be in New York next week, and I'd love to meet you when I'm there. I had no plans to be in New York next week. I could be in New York next week, though. Joe called. He wanted to meet. I hopped on the train, and up to New York I went. I was quickly offered a job and was soon packing up my apartment in D.C. and moving to New York City a place I'd never particularly wanted to live, but my excitement about this new job propelled me forward. I had to start work right away, but I had nowhere to live. So my kind and generous college roommate Sarah let me crash on a futon in her tiny place on the Upper East Side, and I scoured the listings in the newspaper at night and on the weekends. Finally, I found it, a place on West 87th Street on the Upper West Side, right off of Central Park West. If I craned my neck, I could see the park, so I sort of pretended I had a park view. It was a former townhouse renovated into several apartments. The landlord who lived on the top floor read through my application and said, I think you'd be a good tenant, but with this salary, you're basically living below the poverty line. I pleaded with him and assured him I'd pay the rent on time each month. He was reluctant, but apartment D was mine. At this point, in the fall of 1993, TVFN, as we called it, was in its very early stages. It wasn't live on the air yet. We were in pre-production, planning to launch around Thanksgiving. We didn't have a proper studio or office. We were using this converted space way down on 34th Street between 10th and 11th Avenues. It wasn't convenient to anything. I'd take the subway down to Penn Station and then walk and walk and walk. Everything in that office was ramshackle. We'd sit on overturned cardboard boxes or boards with splinters. There wasn't a proper kitchen for a food network or a real studio. It was all makeshift as the executive searched for a permanent home for the network. Our president and founder was a man named Reese Schoenfeld. He was a big guy with big credentials. The biggest was that he had started CNN. Everyone thinks Ted Turner did, but the truth is it was Turner's idea and Reese brought it to life. And then he ran CNN and was the president for its first three years. So for me, the idea of working for Reese was really exciting. With CNN as part of his DNA, Reese was certain of one thing. 
This new network needed as its centerpiece a news show, and it needed to be live. The show was called Food News and Views. This is the TV Food Network. The TV Food Network is serving up something for everyone. And while our viewers come from all sorts of backgrounds, they all have one thing in common. They love to eat. The TV Food Network, always delicious. I was hired to be a writer and a producer on the show, to write the newscast each day, produce stories out in the field, and to specifically produce a segment called Cookbook Corner, which aired each Friday. When we first started, we all did everything. One of my first days, I was asked to photocopy the scripts for the anchors. I later was talking with my parents on the phone, and, like an entitled young overachiever, I was complaining about being too educated to have to Xerox things. My dad told me point blank, you are not too good to do that work. Everyone has to be a sort of apprentice in whatever industry they enter. Do the job that's asked of you and do it well. Maybe not the advice I wanted to hear, but it was the advice I needed to hear. We were a motley crew. There was no such thing as food television before, so we were a mashup of both. Some of us had food backgrounds and were just learning how to do TV, and some were television veterans, mostly from TV news, but didn't know anything about food. In fact, our founder and president, Reese Schoenfeld, and his wife, Pat O'Gorman, who was one of the top producers at TVFN, famously had renovated their apartment in Manhattan and had their kitchen removed. That's how uninterested in cooking they were. Here's Reese from a panel in 2013, during a 20-year retrospective on the founding of the Food Network. At the beginning of a network, I don't know who was a food expert. I certainly wasn't. The anchors of Food News and Views mirrored the situation at the network. David Rosengarten was a foodie who hadn't done much TV before, and Donna Hanover Giuliani was an experienced TV anchor who didn't know much about food. On Food News and Views, award-winning journalist Donna Hanover and food and wine expert David Rosengarten update you on all the news that's fit to eat. The reason Donna took the gig was that at the time she had to stop working in hard news because her husband was running for, and as we were working together, he became the mayor of New York City, Rudolph Giuliani. Donna officially became the first lady of New York City just a few months after we started working together. I remember her coming in for the first time after the inauguration, just glowing and laughing about her son Andrew's antics on the podium. It was so exciting for me, like I was hobnobbing with the royalty of New York. But it wasn't all heady fun. We were working hard towards a common goal, launching this new network on the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, November 23, 1993. The execs had decided this was good synergy, a food-focused holiday, a new food network. So on that first day, we of course had lots of Thanksgiving-themed stories and segments. I helped produce a piece about how to properly carve a turkey. We had a few enormous roasted turkeys and side dishes on set, which we had to repeatedly tell the staff and crew not to eat after the show, since they'd been sitting out for so long. The last thing we needed was the entire staff out with salmonella poisoning. A guest came on to demonstrate how to cook a turkey rotisserie style, and I was given the rotisserie set to take home afterwards. I swear those metal bars clanked around in kitchen cabinets of every apartment and house I lived in until about 10 years ago, and in all that time, I never once rotisseried a turkey. The biggest excitement for me upon launching, or at least for my family, was that that week there was an article in the New York Times about the Television Food Network, and along with it, a photo of me helping to set up a segment. I'd made it into the Times, if only in a photo, arranging a turkey. A few weeks later, we had the Television Food Network's first holiday party at a place called Landmark Tavern in Hell's Kitchen. I wrote about it in my journal. Just a note about the people I refer to. Reese, as I already mentioned, was the founder and president of the network. Sue Huffman was the vice president of programming. And Doris was the most wonderful colleague in the newsroom, a real foodie and sort of like a mother figure to many of us. Friday, December 10th, 1993. I just returned from the first ever TVFN Christmas party. I am truly blessed to work with such a fabulous group of people. Interesting, fun, caring, talented... Had a great talk with Reese. What am I doing chatting up the founder of CNN, and the TVFN for that matter, and many others? Sue Huffman told her husband, This is the person from California, the one I was telling you so much about, 
who he absolutely had to get. Doris's husband, Bob, said, I haven't met Elizabeth, but I've certainly heard all about her. I am just so excited about this field, and I'm just determined to succeed. It is thrilling to feel this way. But I wasn't always so excited. A mere nine days later, the tenor in my beloved journal was quite different. I just phoned home and found out that my sister had gotten engaged. I was happy for them, but... Sunday, December 19th, 1993. It's just the circumstances, I guess. Me sitting in this dumb $10 blue chair in my hollow, cold apartment, alone. That winter in New York was brutal. The storms just kept coming and coming and coming. The wind would tear through the avenues, piercing my ears as I trudged to the office from the subway at Penn Station. I'd often repeat to myself with each step, I chose to be here, I chose to be here. Journal entry, Friday, January 14th, 1994. I was doing a few last-minute things in the studio before taping when Reese came in. We had a little exchange about controversy being good in journalism. Then he said, uh, Elizabeth, do you have a minute? I followed him into the entryway, a bit nervously, I might add. I thought being called over by the president was good news, but a flash of dread pierced through my mind as well. He said, As you probably know, we're going to make some changes in the news program. Reshuffling. And I want you to know that I think you're doing an excellent job. I'm very happy with your contributions to the newsroom. Thank you very much, I said, quite flattered. Well, he continued, I don't know what your plans are, but I've heard from other people that you may want to be on air, do some reporting. Well, from my past experiences, I have to say that I hope you'll stay on the inside to really learn the ins and outs for at least a year or so. I think there are lots of people who can do the outside work, but very few who can really create a good news program, and I think you are one of the few people who can help do that. I thanked him and said, you certainly made my weekend. To hear praise from the founder of CNN was a bit heady. A part of me is a little disappointed because I do want to report, but I really trust Reese. He knows this business. He knows what he's doing. I've heard him speak of his protégés at CNN, and I wonder if I may become one at TVFN. It's nice to hear I'm doing well. I feel so fortunate to love it as well. In the spring of 1994, our offices moved to the 31st floor of a beautiful building on 6th Avenue in Midtown. It was fantastic. Right near Rockefeller Center and Bryant Park, lots of places to go sit outside at lunchtime, and just a more central area overall. And we had actual studios with actual kitchens. We felt like we were literally moving up in the world. We were working hard. I had a lot of dreams. I was getting positive feedback. But the network wasn't in many homes. We weren't even on in our home turf, New York City, so our own friends couldn't watch us. I remember once I was in a segment and I wanted someone I knew to see it, so I called family friends in Honolulu. That's the only place I knew that it was being aired. Hot stuff coming through. Next, food news and views. All the news that's fit to eat. New products, the latest cookbooks. So come and get it only on the TV Food Network. Our show, Food News and Views, went on at 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. So we had an unrelenting daily deadline. An hour-long show to put on every day. The first segment was newsy. We'd report on anything food-related. And if you think about it, almost anything can have a food angle. We covered serious topics growth hormones in farm animals, genetically modified foods, and policy debates on farm subsidies. We covered the lighter side, what they were serving at a White House state dinner or what Wolfgang Puck was preparing for the governor's ball after the Academy Awards. I'd go down to the Fulton Fish Market at four in the morning to interview fishmongers about their fresh catch. I'd meet restaurateurs like Danny Meyer of Union Square Cafe and do stories about new chefs like Bobby Flay and Mario Batali. Sometimes an assignment would be to go out to cover a big event in the city, because there's always food there, right? Initially, we were one-man bands, meaning each producer would shoot, report, and produce their stories. It was pretty unwieldy having to carry those cameras around. But fortunately, eventually they hired cameramen, so we'd go out in a team of two. Those of us who were hoping to be reporters eventually would always shoot what are called stand-ups, Maybe a summary of the event on camera with a sign-off at the event. Like, in New York City, this is Elizabeth Pearson for TVFN. 
As Reese implied earlier, he wasn't looking to make any of us into reporters. But they knew that's what I wanted to do, so they were fine with me working on my tape. The network was still such a small operation that I remember if we had a shoot, we'd just go to the operations department and ask for petty cash and say, for example, I need it for taxi fare to the tavern on the green for an event tonight. Then you'd get receipts from the cabbies and write your name and event and show on the receipt, and that was it. Pretty low-stakes bookkeeping. Then we'd come back and go into little video editing booths and complete our pieces for the show that night. One contributor they hired for our show was a veteran TV newsman named Bill Boggs. He did a segment a few times a week about food-related gossip called The Daily Dish. Here's an old clip I found of Donna Hanover Giuliani introducing him. Now Bill Boggs is here with the inside scoop in this week's Daily Dish. Bill? Well, thank you very much, Donna. Yes, once again, ready or not, we continue our exploration into the rapacious appetites of celebrities. George Clooney has a big appetite for work. He'll be shooting ER and the new Batman movie simultaneously, but he took the time last week to have lunch every day with former Catwoman Michelle Pfeiffer at Gloucester Fish House here in Manhattan. Let's go. From Bill was a super nice guy, and years later when I saw the movie Anchorman, I thought of him because of this story. One day, Bill was filling in for our regular anchor, David. I'd produced a segment on ancient grains that were becoming popular. Mind you, this was in the mid-90s, so these weren't nearly as well known as they are now. One of them was quinoa. As you may know, quinoa is spelled Q-U-I-N-O-A. Now, I knew that despite briefing Bill ahead of time, this was going to be tricky on live television. So I did what many of us producers would do. I spelled it out phonetically. In the script and on the teleprompter, I wrote for him K-E-E-N dash W-A-H. So the segment starts, and Bill begins reading. We're talking today about this really interesting ancient grain called quinoa. Pause. And then he goes off script and says, That's spelled K-E-E-N-W-A-H. No! I immediately run into the control room so they can talk into his earpiece to correct him. Oof. The trials and travails of live TV and unpredictable people. From the start, as I mentioned, I was tasked with producing a weekly segment called Cookbook Corner. I loved it. We got flooded with new cookbooks from publishers, hoping we would feature their authors on our show. I worked a lot with Doris, the absolutely wonderful motherly figure I mentioned before, to determine who we should choose. Then I got to pre-interview them and decide what they'd cook in the segment and plan the entire segment out. Needless to say, this played right into my cookbook addiction. I acquired so many amazing cookbooks, most of which moved with me from city to city throughout my many moves after I left TVFN, until I finally decided I needed to give many of them away. But I still cherish the core favorites. If you're a Food Network fan, you probably associate the network with Emeril Lagasse, so I want to touch on him a little bit. Emeril wasn't there at the very, very beginning. The first two shows on the network were Food News and Views and a show hosted by Robin Leach called Talking Food but Emerald came shortly thereafter. However, his first show was taped in Tennessee, so we didn't really know him from the start. We only had our two shows out of New York. But in August of 1994, they gave Emerald a new show, Essence of Emerald, and moved production to New York. Ooh. Oh, yeah! When that all burns off and you got all the essence in that sauce... Some of my friends started working on it, but I never did. Emeril was always super nice, though. He was much softer and quieter than his on-air persona. A very sweet guy. Early on, Reese had decided that a key component to making the network legitimate was to have Julia Child on board. To my great delight, a deal was made. Hi, I'm Julia Child. Every Friday, all six feet of the legendary Miss Julia came traipsing into our offices to appear on our show. The chicken with his crusty savor. She was always jovial, if also occasionally a bit weary. One time a makeup artist kept trying to wake her up to do her makeup for the show, before finally giving up and just letting her snooze through it. Julia would walk around offering words of wisdom and little good days. Just a lovely woman. Anyway, bon appetit. It all was exciting, frenetic, crazy, exhilarating, exhausting. There was an energy to the place, but it was also relentless. We worked long days, and we didn't have holidays off. I remember walking to work on the 4th of July, 
for some reason wearing red, white, and blue, even though I wouldn't be celebrating anywhere but at work, thinking, I know why real news shows need to be on the air every day, but food news? My parents came into town for the second Thanksgiving, since I couldn't go home, and we cooked a traditional dinner in my teeny tiny kitchen after I got home from work that day. Fortunately, since I live near Central Park West, at least my parents could watch the big balloons in the Thanksgiving Day Parade. I was at work. Here's Pat O'Gorman from that 20-year retrospective panel. When the Food Network first started, we worked, I worked, seven, and so did everybody else that's here, uh, seven days a week. We worked from eight in the morning till eight at night. That's how you, how we got a library. But you were, you were following the CNN model. You thought basically this was CNN with such stoves. So you just wanted to, you wanted fresh programming. That's what you Well, we had to have it. We had to have it. We were on 24 hours a day and we had to have fresh programming. My comment about the early days is it was a lot of fun. The Food Network was a lot of fun. We got hysterical and we yelled at each other and we, we laughed and we cried, but it was fun. It was fun. We worked toward an end that we, that we accomplished. There were some hard days. Donna Hanover Giuliani started to come in looking worn and very sad. She'd go straight to a conference room and sometimes not want any producers to come in and brief her on the show. She always had two police officers with her, by the way. As the First Lady of New York, they were her security detail. We became friends with them and would sometimes give them snacks from the leftover shoots. Often Donna would bring in bags of popcorn to snack on. I don't know why that little anecdote sticks with me, but it does. When we'd walk by that conference room where she'd hole up, we'd sometimes hear her screaming into the phone. Right around that time, rumors started surfacing about her husband, Rudy, the mayor, having an affair with one of his aides. There was a lot of crying in that conference room. Donna was such a professional and such a warm and kind person. I remember Rudy coming in once after the show with a bunch of security and other people in tow. He didn't wave to or acknowledge any of us, his wife's co-workers. As the network grew, of course there were changes. That happens inevitably. Those of us who had been there since the start lamented some of the changes, even as we were excited about the new shows that kept appearing and sometimes disappearing. I had nothing to do with management. I just wanted to put my head down and keep trying to do good work and eventually get on the air. But I would get discouraged when I'd get promised a raise or a promotion and then it would take a while to actually happen, if at all. We were all overworked and underpaid. It was starting to wear. I was also getting worn out of living in the city. I began dreaming about living in a suburb and commuting into work. And one weekend when I was visiting a friend and her family in Greenwich, Connecticut, about 45 minutes outside the city, I casually started looking at moving there. Then, in November of 1995, ownership changed. And two years after founding and running the network, Reese left. A lot of us knew big changes were coming. In January of 1996, our little news team was told that people didn't really want to watch a show about food news. Maybe light, food-related content, but not what we'd been doing. They were canceling our show and replacing it with a half-hour show in a different format. I was asked to move to a dining show, where I'd produce segments about restaurants all over the country. I thought about it for about a minute, if that. It was pretty much the polar opposite of where I wanted to go, career-wise. I didn't want to just produce, and I definitely didn't want to be traveling all over the country. I wanted more of a life. What had made TVFN so special, for me, was disintegrating too. The tenor of the place was changing, and a lot of my favorite people were leaving. I decided to leave too. Instead of moving to Greenwich, I decided to move to Los Angeles. Here's my journal entry from Friday, February 2nd, 1996. I have returned from my last official day at TVFN. Of course, the chapter's not completely finished. In typical TVFN management style, they were not organized or thoughtful enough to have come to a resolution regarding my promised but not granted title change and retroactive pay. But I don't want to dwell on the negative stuff, and there is plenty now. The positive part of the place is the people, at least the under VP and executive producer level. They are the reason I'm feeling sad. I have not a tinge of remorse about leaving the job or work aspects. 
I'm so excited about my tape, which I finally finished today, and about searching for and moving into a reporting position. I know that I'm going places in this business, and I'm thrilled about what lies ahead. But I already miss my friends at TVFN. For better or for worse, they have been my family in New York. I'm so fond of these folks, and the past few days have been especially gratifying because it's clear that the feeling is mutual. I've received many very affirming and encouraging words. It's nice to know that consideration of others, respect, and generally conducting yourself in a positive, moral, and thoughtful manner, which I try to do, is effective. Like the world of TV, in which we all are dependent on each other to get the show on each night, what's really important in the real world is how we treat people what kind of impact we have on each other and on the world at large. I have felt very lonely at times these past 27 months, but I now recognize that I have been blessed with a lot of love, just from a source, work, that was novel to my life experience. Things won't ever quite be the same. I know that is how those who are left at TVFN feel too. I feel sorry for them, not for myself. It is hard to be left in the shell of a situation when the substance is gone. I'm grateful for my friends, but it's a strange evening. As the snow falls outside, I feel peace and serenity, excitement and confident anticipation, as well as profound sadness. Something lost, a lot gained. It was quite a ride. Usually I do takeaways from my conversations with other people. It feels a little strange to create takeaways from my own experiences, but here goes. Number one, take risks. Say you're going to be in New York, even if you're not, just so you can get that meeting. You can pivot later if you want to, but you'll never regret having tried. Two, no one is too important to make photocopies. Three, You can hold different emotions at the same time. Excitement, sadness, confidence, peace. Four, let yourself experience love from whatever source is giving it, even if it feels novel, like work friends. And finally, number five, we're all dependent on each other, and not just to get a television show on each night. I'd love to know your thoughts about this episode, and actually any of the previous episodes too. Please go to theexperiencepodcast.net and send me a message on social media. You can also sign up for our newsletter there. I'd really appreciate it if you'd rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast. I'm Elizabeth Pearson Gar. Thank you for joining the experience. Mm-hmm.